you just offer some words of worship out there? Come on, everybody, just raise your worship. Come on. Come on, just a little bit louder. Raise your worship. can describe the feeling I have down inside it's hard to contain, it's hard to contain it so I'll, so I'll simply say Jesus Round. But can y'all try to catch it and sing along with us? Come on, help me say millions here. Millions of words can describe the feeling I have down inside. It's hard, it's hard to contain it, church. So, so I release my worship and simply say, lesson tonight will be presented by Pastor Pastor Brown. Hear ye him. Amen. Amen. We reverence God and thank him for our being here this evening and we certainly are grateful to our superintendent Deacon, Mark, Deacon William Collins um, for leading us in our devotional period and to all the teachers, all of you God's sons and daughters. Uh, we are preparing for our lesson, third Sunday, November 17th, mm. uh, Faith That Is Focused, mm. amen. And we're dealing with the writing of Peter, um, both in, uh, First Peter chapter one, and then we're also looking at Galatians 5, uh, 22 and 23. But uh, we're talking about focusing, focusing our faith. Um, and a lot of times, if we don't focus on something, we'll be distracted by everything. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of the distraction is to keep us from achieving our goal. And so if our faith is focused, what is our faith focused on? Mm. Um, I think our faith should be focused on uh, the responsibility we have now and the promise that we have for the future. All right. The responsibility that we have now and how we deal with that is going to uh, determine where the destiny of our future will lead us. Amen. It's not enough to just know the word if you're not focused enough to be a doer, uh, knowing won't do anything but make you feel bad Amen, sir. when it comes time to have to give an account. Our writer tonight is uh, Peter, and Peter is uh, no stranger to any Bible reading Christian or uh, anyone who studies the life of Christ. You know that uh, Peter was a part of Jesus' uh, inner circle. Uh, along with these brothers, James and John. Um, he also had a brother that was a part of the 12. Uh, but, but Peter stood out for many reasons. And uh, this lesson of this writing kind of points out that even though he had been saved and changed and got the Holy Ghost, he still was not reluctant to say what he thought. Amen. Amen. And, and Peter, a lot of times, uh, during the time of Christ, uh, was one of them uh, perplexing type of uh, 
should I say, disciples. Mm -hmm. uh, most disciples are always going along with the program and easy to get along with. Uh, but Peter questioned Christ. Mm -hmm. He challenged him uh, when Jesus uh, said that he was going to uh, Jerusalem to be crucified. He said, don't say that. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be crucified. Um, and and uh, Jesus had to literally say to him, because he knew the impact that was making Peter say what he said. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Mm -hmm. He really wasn't talking to Peter. He was talking to that influence that was working on him and making him do uh, things contrary. Now, Peter had it in him, <laughs> amen, uh, to fight. Yes. Amen. Uh, uh, on the night they took Jesus, you know, we always hear about how Jesus was helpless and they took him. Uh, a lot of people don't tell the story about how Peter took out his blade. Mm -hmm. And went to cutting. <laughs> Made Jesus perform an unscheduled miracle. He had to replace a man's ear because Peter had cut it off. And when Jesus told Peter, you know, to put up his knife and all of that, amen, Peter said, look, I'm here for you, but you won't let me do what I want to do. <laughs> Amen. Uh, some say that fish uh, that Peter was a kind of a large in statue man, big burly fisherman, and so he was a rugged type of guy. But God, through the power of the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. uh, took that ruggedness that probably was very contrary and made it into a powerful leader of the faith. Amen. And so uh, tonight Peter is writing to this church and some say that the gospel of Mark uh, could be called the gospel of Peter mm -hmm. because in reality John Mark accompanied Peter after he left Paul and, and, and uh, his uncle Barnabas and on many occasions he encountered and worked with Peter and he was kind of Peter's support uh, person. But uh, we don't have a gospel of Peter. But we do have these two epistles mm. uh, that bear his name. Mm. So uh, we note in chapter 2 of the book Acts that a great change, a dramatic change, came over Peter after Jesus' resurrection. Amen. He grew spiritually, constantly preaching, teaching, and healing in Jesus' name. You know, honestly, when Jesus came out of the wilderness, Mark say he came out preaching, teaching, and healing. Mm -hmm. Amen. And the work of the disciple of Jesus Christ is preaching, teaching, and healing. Amen. And I, I'm not saying that, that, that every preacher has the ability or is a conduit for healing, but I'm saying that I, I see in Scripture that those that followed Christ had many of his abilities and powers, and of course preaching and teaching is the responsibility of every believer. Amen. Every believer. Uh, and, and we are responsible uh, to share the word, the karupa. Uh, to let men and women know uh, of what God has done and especially what God has done through his son Jesus Christ and Peter took it on a personal responsibility to preach, teach, uh, and heal. The time of the writing of Peter was a time of terror, of living day by day, or day to day and being tempted to abandon the faith. Uh, and this was the backdrop for Peter's two lessons. And honestly, it it's almost mirrors our time. A lot of people today are tempted to abandon the faith. Yes, yes, yes. And the reason they're tempted to abandon the faith is because they have forgotten what they're supposed to be doing and they have forgotten what is the end promise of doing it. The hope of his presence as we do his work now 
and the hope of his coming. Amen. Amen. We don't talk about his coming anymore, but the truth is, he's coming. He's coming. Amen. And the reason I know he's coming is because he said he's coming. Amen. And the same one who said he's coming again, it was prophesied of him throughout the Old Testament. Can I tell you, there's more said about, in the Bible, his second coming that was said about his first coming. Amen. Because a lot of writers, uh, i.e. Daniel, and even some of Isaiah, they point beyond his first coming. And talk about him coming back as a conquering king. That, 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 that's something that bears looking into that the promise of his coming the second time uh, is as strong or stronger than the promise of his coming the first time. And guess what? He came the first time, just as he was promised. Yeah. Amen. And he came under what could be called impossible situation. Amen. A virgin be with child. In that day, that's an impossible situation. And, and, and the chastisement of God's peace is going to be upon him. Amen. He's going to bring peace to mankind that had not existed, especially for the last 500 years, mm. where God's enmity between him and man has been, uh, the divide has gotten greater, but now he comes. And so uh, Peter and Paul were in Rome uh, in the mid-60s, uh, uh, while Nero persecuted uh, the church, set Rome on fire and blamed it on the church and Christians and as a result he killed thousands of, of, of Christians and it believed that it was in Rome that Peter was crucified. Amen. Uh, what's the distinction of Peter's crucifixion? Upside, upside, down. upside down. So the upside down cross, if you ever see the cross, and a lot of people are saying that's a demonic symbol. No, the upside down cross is called the cross of Peter. Hmm. Now, I don't know if you've seen it in some of these fictitious uh, movie about evil that when the cross turns upside down, it's no longer worshiping Christ, it's now worshiping the devil. That is not true. That is a symbol of Peter's cross that he took on himself. He said, I cannot and I will not be crucified like my master. Mm -hmm. So they crucified him upside down. But that's not, our story now is what uh, Peter wrote. And he's writing today, brothers and sisters, about being focused. And we all know what being focused is about. We know what it means to be focused and we know what it means not to be focused. Mm -hmm. Amen. Or as some people said, tune in. <laughs> Amen. A lot of times we tuned out so much. Amen. We don't know what it means to be tuned in. Amen. So he gives us three things in this lesson that we need to uh, be focusing on. Focusing first our minds. Mm -hmm. Focusing our faith. And then focusing our love. Focusing our minds, focusing our faith, focusing our love. Um, verse 13a is where our printed text begins. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your minds, be sober. <laughs> to, to gird up back then in that day, had to do with a, a, a man taking his robe and pulling it all together and tucking it into his belt, creating what we would call probably pants so that he could run or even fight, amen, without stumbling over his garment. And a lot of us are stumbling over everything, amen. We stumbling over what people say about us. We stumbling over what we see people say about one another. We stumbling over what people say about the preacher. And we stumbling over maybe what the preacher said, something that wasn't 
uh, in, in your liking. We, we stumble over the gospel because we're saying God can't be that harsh where he would condemn people and sometimes they may not know no better. Let me just say this. Don't stumble over the word of God. Believe the word of God. Mm. Amen. You have to believe the word of God. But, but here he said, focus our minds. And brothers and sisters, the battle today is for the mind. And my theology uh, uh, that I hope is biblically based is he that has the mind has the man. God said he'd keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on him. Well, what happens when you put your mind on other stuff? The devil probably say he'll keep you in perfect confusion. <laughs> if you keep your mind stayed off of God. And there are a lot of things that still our focus. Amen, sir. Amen. And, and, and some of the things are honestly serious issues. They're issues that we just can't totally ignore. But our main focus, brothers, sisters, Christians, believers, should be on what God has commanded us to do. Amen. Amen. Everything else is peripheral. Mm. The main agenda is what God has told us to do. Some people wonder why uh, 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 oxens and or uh, 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 mules have blinders on when they're working, trying to keep their focus. Amen. Because without the blinders on, your eyes going to be detracted and distracted you know, and the truth is, to plow a straight line, you have to look straight ahead and you have to have a target. Amen. Or you think you're going straight. <laughs> Amen. Especially out here in this snow, just decide you're going to walk in a straight line, but you don't have your focus on a target. Mm. Then after you walk about 10 steps, look back at it. <laughs> See how straight it is. It's hard to write, to walk in a straight line without a focus. And a lot of people today can't walk in a straight line in their relationship with God, in their relationship with the church, because they have too many distractions. Amen, sir. Amen. I'm not anti-sports. Amen. I play sports. I like sports. But sometimes, when your team playing on Sunday, you can't go to church. Your focus is off. Hello? Amen. And when your focus is off, you'll find yourself not walking that straight line. Now, guess what? We can always excuse everything we do. But we condemn others for what they do. Wherefore, uh, uh, indicates that the train of thought is a conclusion of previous statements regarding the works of the prophets their work was not only for their contemporary audiences, but also to minister to those who hear and believe the gospel later. Amen. So we have to remember that what we are doing is impacting how other people look at us and look at God and look at the promises of God to gird up the loins, gathering up, his long robe like a garment, tucking it tightly into his belt. Again, I said this allows his legs to be unhindered for working and for fighting. The image suggests that one's mind must be prepared to pay close, focused attention. And we don't focus on our relationship with God and Jesus Christ like we ought to. Amen. And when you're not focused, you'll say stuff do that you stuff. shouldn't be saying. Amen. Amen. You'll do stuff that you should, shouldn't be doing. Amen. Whereas if you just stay in focus, Amen. you won't lose that grip. And here's verse 13b, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you 
at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So believers' focus should be on the return of Jesus. That's your end focus. And your current focus is what should I be doing in preparation for his return? Amen. So I got a, I got a current focus and I got an end focus. And all this focus does not take me away from the general, the, the realities of life. This gives hope because of the promise of grace associated with that event. Grace refers to the good news of Christ's return. Good news for believers, bad news for persecutors. And I think we forget that God said he's going to take care of all the persecutors. Amen. And all those that are going to do evil against us, God has already promised, I'm going to take care of them. Hope gives strength to endure in hard times mm. because present troubles pale in comparison to future glory. And, and don't we sometimes get distracted by present troubles Amen. to the point that we forget about future glory. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We had a member here named Mrs. Lee when I first came here some 43 years ago. I used to visit her and on, a, on a regular basis and she would always say to me, God's going to right and all wrong. <laughs> and he's going to handle all enemies. That was her focus. And she lived a happy life in spite of the diagnosis that the doctors had given her. And, and, and by the way, she outlived the doctor that had diagnosed how long she was going to live. She outlived him because her focus was on the hope of the promise of Jesus Christ. It gives us strength to endure hard times with his faith that Jesus can return at any moment, Peter reminds us of Jesus' own warning to be ready for his return. And, and I guess if I was going to take a, a little uh, survey, I, I, would, I would have two boxes, and I'd have you to check ready or not ready. <laughs> Amen. And I'd ask you before you check that box, think about it. Before you check that box. Ready or not ready? Here is the surety. He's coming. The surety is he's coming. The question is, are you ready? Or are you not ready? Now you remember, I know, I know y'all remember that game where it said, ready or not. <laughs> Here I come. <laughs> ready or not. Here I come. And so we ought to be ready. And we ought to focus uh, with sobriety, but we ought to so focus with holiness. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. Amen. We ought to be focusing on living righteous life. Let me say this. All of us done things in our ignorance. And some of us weren't so ignorant. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but all of us, and what he was implying here was that many of the people he wrote to were Gentiles. And as Gentiles, they had worshipped pagans. They probably had, had participated in immoral behavior. They probably had lived in a lifestyle that did not square with the Christian lifestyle, but to them it seemed right at that time. And when you're living or uh, operating in ignorance, right seems wrong seems right. <laughs> Amen. We operate in ignorance, wrong can seem right because you don't know. So focused minds must produce focused lives. Peter urges his readers to demonstrate their readiness for Jesus' return by the way they live. Not by the way they sing, not by the way they shout, not by their testimony, but by the way they live. 
we must not be distracted by desire to return to sinful behavior, mm. but instead be like obedient children. Amen. This seems to be particularly, as I said, directed to the Gentiles because of the lifestyle that they have come out of. And some of us came out of different lifestyles, and some of us came out of homes where the truth was not taught. And that's the one thing my wife and I said, that if we don't do nothing else, we want our children to know the truth. Mm -hmm. So that when they get grown and decide to go their own way, they won't able to be back and say, well, mom and daddy didn't teach me nothing. Or my mama never said that to me. Or my daddy never said that to me. Anything they asked, if I thought they were serious about the question, I answered. Amen. And I didn't have no restrictions on it. Because I could be just as open to them as I felt their maturity could handle. Amen. And we got to be open and sincere. And we've got to teach our children the right, the right way of living. Mm -hmm. Even if we ain't doing it. Y'all didn't hear that. Though. Amen. We've got to teach them. Mm -hmm. This is what God wants. This is what God expects. And this is why he wants it. And here is his promise if you do it. And a lot of us are living below his promises and living outside of his promises. And we know why we're living there because we decided not to do it. Mm -hmm. Choices have consequences. Mm -hmm. And so here, Peter is trying to say to them that they ought to walk with holiness. But as he which has called, this is verse 15, you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Listen, I know holy is a word that a lot of us avoid because we think it means perfect. And then we turn around and say, ain't nobody perfect. That's the devil's old lie. Ain't nobody perfect, so you can't be holy. No, holy means set apart for purpose. Amen. If God saves you, he sets you apart. And he's got purpose for your life. No matter what you did before God saved you, he can take that talent, that gift, that ability that you had before you got saved, and he can use it to the glory of his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Moses was a murderer, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. But more than a murderer, he, was, he knew Egypt. He knew how to approach the Pharaoh. He knew how. Uh, uh, to speak with Pharaoh. He understood all the principles. So God can take, in spite of your fault and your big mistake, he can take the rest of what's left of you and utilize it Amen. in his service. So one foundational difference between God and false gods is that God made people in his image. And people make false gods in their image. Amen. They create false gods and say, okay, it's all right to lay up with as many women as you want to. But I can do it because my God says it's all right. Yeah, you have to be loyal to no one wife. No, you don't have to take care of no children because you're not sure they're yours anyway. That's the false gods. But the real God has laid out the rules. And Lord laid out the rules of the home and the, and, and the relationship and the fellowship. And so when, when we are following the real God who created us in his image, he gives us directions. God don't ask you for directions. Amen. And God don't change his word to fit you. The truth is, if you want to fit with God, you've got to change to fit his word. So uh, I serve a God who created the heavens and the earth and all therein is not a God that man created for his own benefits. So holiness demands moral purity. God's actions are pure and righteous. Amen. So his people's actions should also be pure and righteous. Amen. And I know sometimes it's more convenient to do what's not pure. It may even be more beneficial to you at that moment. 
But that moment is not your life. Amen. And you may throw away the future happiness, peace, and love and joy for that moment. Israel was not to be like the other nations which lived wickedly. 2 Samuel 7.23, Ezra 9 and 2. To approach a holy God, a person must have clean hands and a pure heart. To approach a holy God. The, this twofold cleanliness is expressed in right attitudes and right actions. We not only got to have right actions, we got to have the right attitude. Some people will do the right action, but they got such negative and bad attitude. <laughs> Amen. Well, I said what was right, but it's the attitude. So we need attitude adjustments. And then we ought to let that lead to action adjustments. If you won't be holy, you can't be saying one thing and living something else. Amen. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So Peter, instructions are not new revelations for the church but those that are written precepts for the people of God. These instructions were first found in the law of Moses. When the Lord called Israel out of Egypt, guided them to his chosen nation, he demanded one central thing, holiness. Exodus 19, 6 and Exodus 22, 31. Deuteronomy 7 and 6, Deuteronomy 14 and 2, they were not to be like other nations Amen. with their ruthless kings, immoral practices, and injustice toward the poor. They were to be holy because God is holy. Amen. And we ought to be practicing holiness. Really, God's goal was and don't misunderstand it because I don't want you thinking you're greater than anybody else, but he wanted you to be better than just a normal person. He wanted you to live up to a standard that brought glory to his name, Brother Malcolm. He wanted the rest of the nations also to see a living example. And be drawn to a God that could bring men and women Amen, sir. To a state of loving their enemies, do good to those that despitefully use you. Amen. I, I heard a, a preacher the other day, he mentioned this in passing, but, it, but when he mentioned it, amen, it jumped off of him and jumped on me. <laughs> amen. And, 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 and it, was a, it was a thought that, that, that uh, I feel compelled to build. Uh, it, it's called enemy love. I mean. Enemy love. Mm -hmm. Love those that hate you. Do good to those that despitefully you. That's called enemy love. Mm -hmm. And when we move to a state of walking in holiness, now a lot of times people don't want to be associated with holiness because they know. <laughs> that they got some unholy plans mm. on their unholy agenda. Mm. Amen. Mm. But the Lord is calling us, amen, change your agenda. Amen. If your agenda don't bring glory to God, <laughs> amen. amen. Anybody can do like a lot of church folks doing right now. Love they friends, mm. love they clit, mm. but hate those that don't agree with them and don't do what they want to do and don't uh, 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 sometimes bow down to the way they want things done. Anybody can do that. When are we demonstrating that we are a peculiar people, mm. a royal priesthood, mm. God's own representation, 
What is it about me that make people think that I represent God? Is it my big cross or my big Bible? Is it my being able to quote scripture as I walk everywhere? Bless the Lord and hallelujah and praise God, sister. And I'm filled and baptized and amen. Burned with fire as the spirit gives. Is that what makes folks think I represent God? Or is it when they see me treating other folks right? When they see me backing up rather than having the last word all the time. Loving people that I know or that you know don't love you back. You acting like Jesus. You acting like Jesus. But that stuff you putting down now in the church don't look black and it don't act black. Peter says to them that you got to be holy because he is holy. In times of suffering such as the church is experiencing, as Peter writes, fulfillment of personal longings for material things, health, happiness, and even security seems elusive when things are not going right in your life. Mm -hmm. When you're suffering persecutions, mm -hmm. and then you want to get back, but God won't allow you to get back at your enemy. Mm -hmm. If persecution causes Peter's, Peter's audience to turn away from holiness, they will no longer be lights pointing to God. Amen, sir. Mm -hmm. It's when we're struggling that people see through us and they see what we're made of. Amen. It's when we're struggling with issues in life. When the doctor then gave you a bad, bad diagnosis, do you fall apart? Or do you sing to yourself, I trust in God. Mm. Wherever I may be, on the land, on the raging sea, let the billows roll. Mm. He keeps my soul. My heavenly Father mm. watches over me. Mm. I trust in God. I know he cares for me. What's your song? Or is your song something else? Whoa. Amen. Are you singing BB's? King's war song. <laughs> well, what kind of song are you saying? Are you saying, you know, uh, I'm going to get even with him song. But, but what does your behavior through your struggles reflect to the world about your relationship with God? Do you really believe it? Do you really believe he's going to show up in your struggle? Do you believe he can wipe the tears from your eyes? Do you believe he has the power to stop your enemies? Do you believe he'll make a way for you? Amen. In spite of what you're going through. The world ought to see that demonstration. Second thing is, we done talked about uh, 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 focus uh, on our minds. Now we need to focus on our faith. And as, you, as a man thinketh, so is he. Hmm. So if you think down all the time, most of the time you're going to be down. But honestly, you can think yourself up, no matter how the devil and life are trying to drag you down. Focusing on faith, and if ye call on the Father, who without respect of person judges according to every man's work, past the time of your sojourning, here is fear. So he refers to turning to God, or Jesus uh, called God Father so many times he had his disciples calling him Father. Mm -hmm. Amen. Sometimes you hang around people and you'll start calling their grandma, grandma. Mm -hmm. Amen. Jesus called God Father so many times he had, he even taught his disciples when you pray, say our Father. Our Father. Yeah, and so we trust the Father. Relationship implies that Children of the Father will relate to him in trust, in obedience, mm -hmm. and in love. Mm -hmm. I believe that God's got it. Mm -hmm. What do you mean, Reverend? What do you mean God got it? Whatever it is. Amen. God has already said, I got you. That's what Isaiah 43. He says, you're going to go through the flood. It ain't going to drown you. 
you go through the fire, it ain't gonna burn me. I got you. I got you. And no matter what you face in life, you and me can handle this. Not you and your wife, not you and your husband, not you and your auntie, and not you and Big Mama, mm. but you and God who can handle anything. Mm. So God is no respect of person. No one gets preferential judgment. He expects the same holy thoughts, attitudes, and actions from all of his obedient children. And let me say this, and I said it before time and time again, that's the danger of being a church brat. And I use that affectionately because I'm a church brat. Been in, your, been in the church all your life. There's a danger of feeling God owes you something. That God ought to do more for you than he does for this guy that just walked in off the street smelling like marijuana. Or smelling like something else. Maybe he'd been vaping. <laughs> so maybe he smelled like vanilla ice cream. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever flavor we come in and smell it like. But, but, but God is no respecter. He will respect his faith as much as he respects your faith. Amen. So don't, don't, don't be looking to God for preferential treatment. Amen. But here's the key to my preferential treatment, if you want to call it that, is I ought to have a deep-rooted faith. And God always responds to faith. Ooh. Help me, Lord. He expects the whole same holy thoughts, attitudes, and actions from all his obedient children. So how you act? Are you acting up to God's expectation? As children, we were able to hide some disappointments from our parents. That's not so with God. You can't hide nothing from him. Therefore, we should have a sense of reverent fear. It leads us to obedience. Mm -hmm. Peter's message of salvation is a message of grace. And we are saved by faith. Then where does fear of God fit in? Doesn't 1 John 4, 18 say, 1 John, perfect love casteth out fear? Indeed it does, but Peter's idea here is that since the test his audience faces can lead them to unfaithfulness. A proper fear for God is necessary to yield faithfulness instead. And let me say this, we have lost the fear of God. And that's the beginning of knowledge. You're not smart if you don't fear God. Amen. You may think you're smart. You, you may be an academic achiever, but that don't mean you're smart. Smart people fear God. Amen, sir. Good. Verse 18 to 19, for as much as we know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, with silver and gold from your vain uh, conversations received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. And that's how you ought to focus your faith. He loved me enough that he died for me. Yes. Yeah. Amen. I, I, I meant something to God. He thought I was worth saving. Amen. <laughs> he thought I was worth saving. So he sacrificed his life. Amen. He thought I was worth saving. And so I'm not redeemed by what my daddy did. I'm not redeemed by what my mama went behind the door and conjured up with somebody. I'm redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Amen, sir. Out on hill, hill called Calvary. Yeah. And what I'm grateful to my mom and daddy is they told me the story. Yeah. And as a result of that, I got to know the man and got to come into personal con con a, a contact and relationship. And, and, and my redemption is not from silver and gold, mm -hmm. but by the shed blood mm -hmm. of 
Jesus Christ out on and making this point, Peter is likely addressing Christians from a Gentile background since the phrase vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. But the truth is for everybody that if there is any salvation in you, it came through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And ain't nothing wrong with what you do, righteous, and how you live a life that pleases God and all that, but that didn't save you. And you're only able to do that because you are saved. Mm -hmm. Amen. All your righteousness can be traced back to your relationship. Amen. Christ is our righteousness. Amen. Without him, there is no righteousness in us. Amen. Verse 20. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you. So Peter wipes away all the patterns that influence evil behavior by going back to the earliest area, before the foundation of the world. Amen. Jesus is no byproduct of Mount Sinai. Hmm. He, he's no byproduct of, of the Abrahamic covenant. Before the foundation of the world, before forming the heavens or and the earth, before creating men and women, before the first sin, God had planned for our salvation through a spotless lamb who is his son. God's plans are deliberate and God's plans are eternal. The 2,000 years of Jewish history preceding Peter's ministry anticipated the coming Messiah. The revelation of this chosen one, God has come in these last times. For Peter, first century readers in Rome, we are still in those last times which follows this epoch to the end. Jesus returns to judge and save as Peter readers eagerly awaited Christ's return, so do we. The promises of Christ have not changed because a little time has passed. Amen. And it's time more for us than for him because a thousand years in his sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. So what follows, uh, my brothers and sisters, that if you are faithful to God, the promises of God through Jesus Christ are real. Who by him do believe in God, that's by Jesus. These that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. Hmm. Yet your faith and hope might be in God. Hmm. Verse forms a balance for the expectation of Christ's return. Christians hope for the return daily in our painful world. He does not come in our lifetime. Our hopes are not dashed. Amen. Because he's still coming back. Our hope focuses on the Lord God. The one who raised Jesus from the grave to glory. And will do the same for us. Listen. I, mean, I don't know how many of you saw the meteor last night. Amen. Streaking across the sky and, and exploding. And, and, and when I saw that, I'm going to tell you what I thought about. I thought about <laughs> what I said a couple of weeks ago. That something Something's getting ready to happen. happen. Yeah. Remember, I, remember I said that? Yes, now they say that's the closest that one has ever come that can be recorded. Amen. Uh, they can't get closer. Mm -hmm. Y'all don't hear me. And they're streaking every day across the sky. I'm not saying that's what's happening, coming, but something's coming. Some, something's going to get our focus off of all this other stuff. And some people need to be made to think again about God. We've never had this much snow this early in the year. I, my wife and I were talking on our way back.
from Kansas City. I said, you know, I remember occasionally you'd have flurries on, on Thanksgiving and say, wow, look like we're going to get an early snow. Here, it, it's two weeks before, mm. almost three weeks out. Uh, so, but don't be surprised and don't allow what happens in the elements and what happens in the sky and even what's happening in politics, don't let it get your focus off of your faith in God through Jesus Christ. And finally, brothers and sisters, we need to focus our love, focus our minds, focus our faith. Now let's focus our love. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Mm -hmm. Amen. This is all. Lord, deliver me from all this phony love. Mm. Phony love. A pure heart and fervently. Uh, when I think of love, I think of something that has not just words, but has emotion in it. Amen. Uh, the way I used to feel when I was a little boy, uh, I, had, I had an aunt named Aunt Rena, and uh, she had a sister named Aunt Trudy. She wasn't as friendly. <laughs> She's more than disciplinary. But we love to be with Aunt Rena because she liked to hug on you. Amen. And pray with your hair and just say little sweet things to you. Now, Aunt Trudy is in the kitchen cooking and preparing the meal. I guess she loved us as much, too, because she fed us. But <laughs> Aunt Rena always was expressing. And to me, I call that fervent love. Love that's on fire. Amen. That, that want to show you the affection. One word defines how Christians are meant to treat their brethren. One word defines how Christians are meant to treat their brethren in the faith. And that one word is what? What did Jesus say to us? By this, Till all men know, John chapter 13, that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Believers, children of God, we started, we got to start loving each other again. We should have never stopped loving each other. <laughs> but we got to start loving each other again. All this little pettiness that takes our focus and steal our relationships, break down our families, sometimes destroy our homes, is all because we are not demonstrating this love of God. This is more than an act of obedience. Our love for each other is to be unfeigned done with a pure heart and fervently. We must do more than act like we love each other. We must truly care for each other as we care for ourselves. I mean, didn't Jesus say, love your neighbor as yourself? Amen. And how much more should you love a brother of the brethren, the family, the fellowship? Such love motivated acts are the obedience to the truth that Peter wants his readers to practice. Alone, this is difficult. Peter promised this is done through the Spirit. How can you love right? Through the Spirit. How can you forgive right? Through the Spirit. How can you overcome whatever it is that has broken down your relationship? Through the Spirit. God wants to heal every relationship. He wants to heal every family feud. He wants to bring us back together. But sometimes with us and our stubborn, stiff-necked, hard-hearted selves, the Spirit trying to break you down, you say, I ain't going to look like I'm weak. If it's the Spirit trying to lead you into the right direction, get weak and learn how to love. It'll take pressure off your mind. Amen. 
about how you treated somebody, how somebody treated you. And guess what? What I love about God is once he removes the burden of how you treated others, he will also keep away from you the burden of how they treat you. Mm -hmm. Now, some people suffer from that. Mm -hmm. Well, I just don't. Uh, Daddy, I just don't understand why I'm trying to do right by them. Look, you're not held accountable for how people feel about you. Amen. But you are held accountable for how you feel about them. Amen. And maybe you sowed a bad seed, and maybe that seed's got to run its course in that relationship. But believe it that God can heal it through the power of love and the Holy Spirit. You can heal any broken relationship. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Ah. So Peter likely learned from Jesus to speak of salvation as being born again. Where do you hear that? Where do you hear Jesus talk about being born again? Talking to old Nicodemus. Amen. John chapter 3, mm -hmm. around verse 3 through 7. He talks to the Nicodemus about being born again. And when you are born again, the Christian's life is radically changed, going from lost to saved, mm -hmm. from sinner to saint, mm -hmm. from living for oneself to living for Jesus. Woo. We commonly refer to this as conversion, the starting point for a new incorruptible life Amen. is conversion. Ooh. Have you been born again? Ooh. Or as they used to say in the early, early church, have you got good religion? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, Lord, <laughs> by the words of God which liveth, and abide it forever. Becoming a believer is more than emotion. Although it can be an emotional experience. We believe because we have learned from the word of God the truth about Jesus. People cannot believe unless they hear or read about Jesus and his saving work. The gospel is still powerful. Is powerful today. 2,000 years plus after it was first preached. It does not grow old or lose its power. So when you focus your faith, you're going to come back with focused love because the power of God is still real. For all flesh is as grass. And all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof faded away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. Don't, don't get caught up in all the flowery stuff people say to you and say about you. Amen. Because people are fickle. Mm -hmm. These are the same people that said Hosanna. Mm -hmm. And then turn around by the weekend mm -hmm. with saying crucify him. Mm -hmm. don't, don't get caught up in that. But the true pure love of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. is what we are seeking after. And we find that through the word of God. Amen. And how do we find it? Because the word of God is going to last forever. Jesus said heaven and earth mm -hmm. don't pass away. But my word is going to stand forever. Finally, verse 25b, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So Peter ties the words of the prophet Isaiah to his own ministry. The ancient and eternal word lives again in the preaching of the gospel. Now Isaiah first said this about the, the flower withereth. The word of God's grace and mercy for those who experience uncertainty and fear in persecution. The promise of the gospel is eternal and invites them to experience peace and hope. And he will help us to bring it into focus. Our minds, which controls our thoughts, our faith, and finally, 
our love. Mm -hmm. God's holiness motivates our desire for holiness. Because he's holy, I want to be holy. Amen. Amen. I want to be holy. Yeah, Amen. I'm not offended when people call me holy roller. Mm -hmm. Amen. Because I know they call me a whole lot of other things. Mm -hmm. Amen. So I'm not offended when people talk about you must think you something trying to act like you all saved in that. I said, brother, I'm not acting. I'm not acting. I know I'm saved. And that, that doesn't mean I'm calling myself perfect because I know I'm not. But I'm saved in spite of myself. Get your focus back. Get your focus right. Focus your mind. Focus your faith. Focus your you love. Amen. I bless you. Amen. Can you just get to the singing in the atmosphere? Say, I love you. More than anything. I love you. Because your first love me, Jesus. I love you. I love you. Everybody lift two voices high. I love you. Lord, I love you. I love you. I really Sing it from your heart.